So questions on projects? Yeah. So you get it, yeah, you have a, a label that, yeah, you're using duplicate labels. So just um, when you generate the label name, use a fresh number to generate it. So just have a global counter. So there's a label macro, which I, I think you're using, right? You're using a label macro. It just takes a number and then um, all you need to do is just create a, uh, oh, this is, screen is not aligned. So just create something, you know, like a global counter. And then whenever you need to make a fresh label, just increment the counter. And then you'll have a fresh label. You'll, you'll have to do a little more than this, you know, the, um, You know, you might need to save the name, na save the label. And then um, when you're generating labels later on, you can use the fresh number that you created for that label. Oh, I'm guessing that's the source of the duplicate label issue. Yes? The macros, these, sure, yeah, you can create more macros, yeah, yeah, no problem. I tried to give you the uh, the complete set that of everything you'll need, but yeah, if you want to make more, that, that's fine. Other questions on projects? Everybody squared away on projects? It seems. Okay. Um, yeah, if anything comes up, let me know during the uh, class. Okay, so then I, I guess we can just move on to the uh, exam review. So let's just go over the practice final one question at a time. All right, so what uh, command line tool can be used to show the files in a directory? Okay. LS, okay, good. Uh, are there others? Okay. What's that? LA, right? LA. Oh, is that LS A? Yeah. Um, so that, I think that's an alias. Probably. Yeah, there LA. Um, sure, any others? LS A, yeah, there's all the LS variants. Find is another, yeah, is that what you're going to say? Find is another option. Um, what about changing directories? <laughs> Removing directories? Or, uh, uh, copying? You say R sync? Oh, that's what I, I thought I heard something else. Okay, so just be familiar with all the commands that um, I went over. Hopefully, you've you've used these. And uh, so I have a little, you know, the lecture two had this little <laughs> command line crash course. What does PWD do? Print working directory. Print working directory, <coughs> right? What about cat? What's cat do? Prints prints a file. Yeah. Um, so just be familiar with all these. I hope you're using the command line at least some degree. So these should be like just knee-jerk, put down the right answer. So I'll have a question or two on those. Any other questions on this question for Unix command line utilities? Okay, sounds pretty straightforward. All right, so number two. In the compilers we made in class, uh, how did we represent uh, numbers in the input? Yes, anyone? Okay. Yeah. Uh, ASCII, text. ASCII text. Right, ASCII, ASCII text. So in ASCII, if ASCII text is our input, uh, would this binary number, 0000010, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, which is 2 in binary, would this be the format we use to input the number two for our compiler? Who says yes? Who says no? All right, good. Why no? 
What's that? It's binary. Yeah, and so the, the and what, what's the ASCII code for two? It's not this, right? It's not this. Um, okay, good. So just be aware that the input language is, is not the same as the output language, and the representation of the input language is defined by your compiler. It's not, uh, it's not the machine representation of numbers or instructions. It's just text. It's just ASCII text in the compilers that we made. All right, questions on this? Yeah, that sounds, sounds easy for, for all of you. That's good. Um, and what's the name of the data structure that the parser produces? Yeah. AST. What's AST stand for? Abstract syntax tree. You could also say parse tree. I'd, I'd also accept that answer. All right. You guys are doing great so far. Okay. Remember semantic actions in Bison, the parser generator? What were those used for? What did, you, what did you use it for? Yeah. Yeah, to build the AST. So semantic actions can be used for lots of things. And what are semantic actions? Anyone have a definition of semantic actions? Yeah. Uh, code that runs after the structure and contents of the tree. Yeah, so code that runs after the parser recognizes some construct in the tree. It just runs after it. That's why you can use it to generate AST nodes. Because once you've recognized that subtree, you can generate a node for it. And in Bison semantic actions, how do we access the the um, child nodes when generating the tree? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, the dollar sign uh, variables that would access the um, semantic values of the child productions in the grammar construct. All right. So uh, regular expressions. So I'll have some question about writing a finite automaton from a regular expression. You can absolutely use the structured way to do it, or you can kind of figure it out if you want to hack it together. For this regular expression, A followed by B followed by parentheses C star. First of all, which operator is involved here? Which regular expression operator is involved here? Yeah. Concatenation. What about this C star? And are there other operators for regular expressions? Huh? Yeah. Or alternation. Uh, what about parentheses? What operation is that? Yeah. What's that? Oh, clean star? That's, that's the star. What about the parentheses, though? It's kind of a trick question, yeah. Grouping. It's just grouping. Well, grouping, yeah, it's just like in parsing um, math. It's just overriding order of operations or defining order of operations. In uh, most regular expression languages, star is a higher or precedence than AB. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the language that's being defined here. Yeah, good. So, yeah, I may ask what language is being defined. What is this um, string a member of this language? And that's exactly right. This is A followed by B followed by, so is, is what if I just have A, B, and no C? Is that part of this language? Yes. Yes, good. Yeah, why? Why is it part of the language? You can have no Cs. You can have no Cs. Clean star is zero or more. And in the kind of core minimal regular expression language, you can, th this is all you have. You have zero or more concatenation, alternation, and you don't have to have one or more because you can define it in terms of other operators. Yeah? Wait, so that parentheses, no, parentheses is, is just like in math. It just changes order of operations. In this case, though, clean star uh, usually in regular expression languages is a higher precedence than concatenation, or um, lower precedence than concatenation or I can't remember what's the order, but this, this would be first. This would be A, B, followed by um, C star. In other words, concatenation happens first, and then star happens. Like, Say again? I'm sorry, is that again? 
Oh no, I'm saying that uh, A B C star is the same as A B parentheses C star. I just put it there to make it um, uh, explicit what the order of operations was, <coughs> so that you wouldn't have to know what they are. But these are the same language. In contrast, uh, this is so. Yeah, what's what's the is uh, A B a member of this set? Who says yes? Who says no? Okay, good. Why no? Yeah. There's no C. So this is saying all zero or more, so empty string, or maybe that's better for empty. Uh, I don't know how to say empty string. I can't Oh, that's actually epsilon. Uh, This is the language that's being defined by ABC star. So the parentheses just change order of operations. In this case, these two are equivalent in, uh, in, in the usual regular expression languages, where concatenation is like multiplication, and uh, alternation is like or, or plus, and clean star is like exponentiation. It has the same order of operations. Yeah. Are you, are you talking about this one? Yes. No, these are identical. They're identical. No. Even with the parentheses, yeah. Yeah. All right, questions on regular expressions? All right, what about um, defining an automaton for ABC star? So first of all, what is a finite? Automaton or a finite state machine, finite state automaton. What is it? Yeah. Uh, a set of states with defined transitions in a set of states. Okay, great. So you've got a set of states, you've got transitions, you've got accept states, and I think you have start, start state as well. I guess we can put that, yeah. You also have start states. So these are the four components of a finite state machine. Um, what else do you need to know for a finite state machine? <clears throat> yeah, exactly, the alphabet, the input language. So in this, um, well, you may not know the alphabet, but what's, what's at least part of the alphabet for this finite, for this regular expression? Yeah, A, B, and C. So without defining, without having a definition of it, there could be more here, but this is all we know about. Um, okay, so let's make a finite state machine for this regular expression. Uh, all right, so how many states do we want, or what states do we want to have for this? What are the, what are the ways to represent a finite state machine? There's at least one or two. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. So that's a type of state machine. I'm just saying, how do we draw it? Exactly. Yeah, you can either do the graph approach or the table approach. Um, in the exam, I'm not going to go too much into deterministic versus non-deterministic. I'll let let you guys decide which one you want to use. <clears throat> um, but well, yeah, what is the difference between deterministic and non-deterministic state machines? Or if anyone wants to answer, answer. yeah. If you reach an accept state in a non-deterministic one, you don't have to end there to immediately accept. And it also has branching, like non-deterministic branching states on the input. So what is non-deterministic branching? I mean, what is what happens when you have non-deterministic branching? It means you could have multiple transitions for the same uh, symbol, and it could lead to different uh, states. Yeah, you can be basically you can be in multiple states at the same time. So non-deterministic. Oops. In a non-deterministic state machine, 
you can enter multiple states at the same time. So as soon as I enter this state, As soon as I enter this state, I'm also in these states. And whenever I, if I see A, then I transition. Then I transition into these states. Oops. Oh, no. I can't grab it. Then I transition into these states. So I can be in multiple states at the same time. Deterministic finite automaton, I can only be one in one state at a time. Okay, so for ABC star, how can I represent this with a finite state machine, either deterministic or non-deterministic? How many states should we have? Okay, let's put three states. I'll use the diagram version of this. Uh, which one do you want to be the start state? Far right. Okay, so that one. Which one should be the accept state? Far right. Okay, so it's usually represented with a double circle and an arrow in. Um, all right, so how many transitions do we have? Three. Three transitions? Okay, where do they go? So I'll, I'll number these. What transitions do we have? Name one. One to two. Okay, one to two, we got a transition, and what letter of the alphabet? Transition, do we transition on? Three. Okay. What's another transition? Two to three. Two to three. What letter? B. B. And three to three. Three to three. Right. So there's nothing, there's nothing preventing you from having a state that transitions into the same state. Uh, and what letter of the alphabet transitions here? C. Okay. Uh, so how could we prove that this finite state machine or, or some finite state machine matches the regular expression. <clears throat> I don't think I asked this. I won't ask this on the, on the exam, but uh, how could you prove this? Yeah. What's that? You can run it, run it. Well, there's infinite inputs. <coughs> Well, one way is to generate it using, have it, have it correct by construction. So you can use that, uh, that regular expression to NFA construction. You know, you prove that each NFA is the same, and then you prove that the composition matches the regular expression. That's okay. I'm not going to ask you to prove it. We'll just test it. <coughs> okay, good. Uh, questions on this, uh, on this state machine here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the that was the like um, systematic way to go from a regular expression to an NFA to a DFA. <coughs> you can use that if if you like. It's all in the lecture notes, so you can use that. Um, yeah, I'll probably give one that's maybe a little more complicated than this. But if you want to use your cleverness to try to come up with, with it right away. Is this a uh, deterministic finite state machine? Yes. Who says yes, it's deterministic? Okay, is this a non-deterministic finite state machine? Who says yes? Yes. Who says no, it's not a non-deterministic one? Okay, this is also a non-deterministic finite state machine. So the non-determinist finite state machines are a superset of deterministic. So non-deterministic just means you can, be, you can be in multiple states at a time, but if you're in one state at a time. So all deterministic state machines are also <coughs> non-deterministic. Now, it's, a, it's, a non -de it's kind of a degenerate non-deterministic finite state machine because it, it never enters multiple states at the same time. All right, good. Um, how can we represent this with a table? <coughs> Excuse me. So what does the what does the table look like for a um, state machine? 
Yeah. Say again, say again. So that was like part of the construction of the DFA. But the table, let's just start with the columns. What columns are there in a state machine? Okay, so we have the inputs. What about in the first column? What how did we yeah? Well so yeah, um, the DFA NFA was when we were converting between the two. But if you just want to represent the state machine, all you need is the current state and the inputs. And the way the table works is for each state, you have you can look up based on the input the next state to go to. So if I'm in state one and I'll I'll kind of mark these as input and accept. If I'm in state one, uh, what state do I transition to when I see A? Two. Two. What about when I see B? What state do I transition to? Nothing. Nothing. So it's empty. You can record it however you like. You can leave it empty. You can consider it an error state. What about C? What state do I transition to none. from one? Again, none. What about for two? What do I transition to for A when I see A? Error. error state. What about for B? Three. Three. C is also an error. What about for 3? A is error state. B is an error state. And what about for C? 3. All right. Good. Questions on this? So these are two representations for state machines? Yeah. So I, um, I just marked it here in the table. I don't remember what's um, conventional for, for doing this. You could just say somewhere else the accept state is 3. Uh, but I just marked it here in the table. All right, questions about regular expressions? State machines? NFA versus DFA? Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be. So let's do the let's do the proper NFA for this. Okay, so what's the, let's do the diagrams first. Does anyone remember what the diagram looks like for concatenation? These are in the notes as well. So if we have two NFAs that have their own start and end states, and you know, there's going to be some other graph in here, and we have another start and end state, how do we concatenate? Yeah. That's one way to do it. Yeah, you could do an epsilon, or you could just make the start and end states the same. But yeah, you could also do an epsilon transition. That would also that would also work. So let's let's put both of these. So one way to do it is to just make the start state the same as the end state. The the um, first NFA's end state, the second NFA's start state. So two ways, two ways to do it. What about alternation? If I again have two NFA's and I want to implement the and I want to implement the um, alternation. How do I construct alternation? Yeah. Okay, so we make a, a fresh start state and have epsilon transitions that enter both at the same time. So alternation is a lot easier to do in NFA, I think. And then same for the end state. You have an epsilon transition to the same end state. So that's alternation. And then the tricky one, the clean star. 
if I have, so clean star operates on a single expression, so we, if, assuming we have the NFA already created, how do we do clean star? So let's, let's assume we give a fresh start and end state. How do we set this up so that it's zero or more iterations? Yeah. Okay, so start to the end. This handles our uh, zero case. And yeah. Here, this end? So this end to its own start, right? So this handles the one or more. Um, so there's no way to get from the start state to here. So how do we uh, get to the start state to the sub-expression start state? Epsilon transition. Yeah, just an epsilon transition. So we're in both in the state that um, starts reading the sub-expression and also doesn't read it, skips it. And similarly, whenever we're finished the sub-expression, we also will be in the end state for the clean star expression. So there, you know, if you have a case like A star followed by A, when you read A the first time, so this will be, this will be A, when you read A the first time, you don't know whether you're here or whether you're say here. So you'll be in both states at the same time in an NFA until you reach, you know, either the end symbol or some other symbol. In the language. Yeah. What's the syntax? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. I didn't actually give that example. So the syntax is like this, A or B. So you might have, yeah, A or B, uh, the pipe symbol is usually used for that, and concat is just adjacent, adjacency. All right, good. So let's do the, let's use the, um, the systematic way to uh, construct this. <clears throat> so what I didn't point out is that the um, kind of leaves of this tree to do a single character input, you construct a finite state machine like this. You give a fresh start and end state, and then you have a single transition on the character. And so we can do that for every character, uh, every leaf node. You can think of this as a tree where um, well, let's not do the tree. You just have three sub-expressions that um, read a single character. And we can combine concat by lining up their start and end states. And we can, oops, not C star. And we can implement C star using that, that structure we just had before, where we make fresh start and end states, set up all these epsilon transitions for the reasons we talked about, and so this is C, and then this whole NFA here, this is C star. And we can do the same concatenation. We can implement the concatenation by just making the, lining up the start and end states or putting an epsilon transition between the two. And um, yeah, and so we can just set either set the set the accept state to be the final state of our final um, expression here or make a new um, accept state with epsilon. Are right, questions questions on this? A little easier to do digitally I think I can just move move stuff around uh, and this looks a little like an accept state. All right, questions on regular expressions? Yeah. Uh, so just to be clear, with the, so when the expression, when it's the star, and it's like, say you have like vacancy, then a star, it'll only, it'll only be able to prioritize that single C, right? If what you mean if I have this, this regular expression? Well, if you, okay, so if, if you do that, then it would be ABC. Oh, oh okay. which one are you talking about?
Yeah, it's just that it's like think of this like PEMDAS, where this is exponentiation, and uh, alternation is like plus, and concatenation is like like multipl is like multiplication. So it's yeah, it's, it's the order of operations is star, and then well yeah, can star, concat, and then alternation. This is the order of operations. So. Like with like with addition, this would be like if if you think of this as addition and multiplication, like this is not star. Let me do dot and plus. You can think of it like this, and sometimes dot is actually used for concatenation. So it's it's equivalent. Um, the all three of these are equivalent, effectively. Um, but I'll try to I'll put parentheses. That's why I put parentheses so you wouldn't have questions about order of operations because we we didn't really go into it that much. <clears throat> But if we were to make like a compiler for regular expressions, then you know this this would have a parse tree that would be like you know plus multiplication multiplication a b c d and strictly speaking you could you know you could parse the regular expression language and then you can apply these NFA rules at each step so the, this would generate the um, oops, the A state machine, and then when you see, and this would generate the B recognizer state machine, and then concatenation, you would just um, implement the operator. You you just set the two start states to be the same, or add the epsilon transition, just like when you wrote the C compiler. You can write a regular expression compiler using the same techniques. All right. Other questions on regular expressions? Yeah. It has it has higher priority. So it's a little confusing because it's it's confusing to think of it this way because um, it seems like it has low priority because you do A B and then C C C C C C C. But the reason that it has higher priority is because you do this first. So you think of generating an infinite set of C's and then concatenating that. If that, if that makes sense. So if I were to do this operation first, so if I take A, B, C, <clears throat> another way to think of this, let's get, well, let's, let's get our parse tree back. Oh, no, we don't have a parse tree for this. So let me write the parse tree for this. And then another way to think of this is not as state machines, but as languages, sets of, sets of strings. Um, so in this case, it would be, uh, well, there's two concatenations here. Let's make it... Um, I think left left associative. So we have uh, two concatenations going on here. We've got A and B concatenated together, and then we have clean star of C. So this tree is saying apply the star first. And then can and then actually it'd be sorry I uh, this is not nicely done sorry about that I added an extra step here so we have concatenate and on the left hand side it's the concatenation of A and B and on the right side of the concatenate is the star of C so this is this is concat concat and clean star. So just like for a tree where we have, like, say we have A plus B times, let me do, dot times C, the parse tree for this would be plus, yeah, I, I realize that using a dot for this is probably probably a bad idea, but uh, let, me, let me use multiplication to make this clear. So this would be plus A and then times B, C. So when you go to evaluate this expression, you do the B times C first. You compute that first, right, in order of operations. And then you compute the A plus whatever that result is. So you can analogize that here where you can first compute 
C star, whatever that means, then you compute A concat B, and then you compute the concatenation of that. And so what compute C star means, C star means uh, generate a set of zero or more C's. So this would be an infinite set. Another way to say it is with set constructor, you can say C n for n equals, or really n, in the uh, set of uh, integers, I guess. So you can think of generating this set of, of, uh, of strings. And so when you go to concatenate this set, you just, so if I do B concatenated with C star, that would be epsilon followed by BC, followed by BCC, followed by BCCC. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So you generate this, the infinite set first, and then you concatenate something to it. And the concatenation just takes whatever the left operand was and just concatenates it with every element of the right operand. Yeah. Exactly. It would be it would be like this. It'd be like this. You concatenate everything first and then do star. Yeah, that's, that's right. So I'm, 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 I was trying to avoid the precedence issue by putting parentheses, but I think it's I think it's good to go into. I think the probably the, the the easiest way to think of it. Well, I hope the easiest way to think of it is with PEMDAS, where c c star is like an exponent, like c to x or c to n, and uh, concatenation is like multiplication. And then alternation is like addition. And using this um, reasoning here, where you, what it means to do C star first is to generate that whole infinite set first. I don't know. Does that help? Does that help? The automaton. Well, the the automata upon depends on, yeah, depends on the the order of operations. So the, so the automaton for sorry I'm I'm jumping around the automaton for A B C star. As long as we apply our precedence rules, is the same as the automaton for A B. Parenthesis C star, so that as you do C star first, and you could even further disambiguate the rules by making it left um, uh, left associative or not left associative I can't remember what it's called you make it left uh, prioritized you make priority doing the left operations first so then A and B gets concatenated with whatever the result of C star is so in our finite state machine this was C star we computed it we computed we constructed the state machine by itself and then concatenated it with whatever the, whatever a b was whatever the left operand was so i think if you kind of do this intuitively i was hoping you could do this kind of intuitively but yeah this is the getting in the weeds of the regular expression language definition itself it's just like for simple c where we have order of operations and we have um, yeah, precedence and operators multiplication goes first if you think of it that way, I, I, I hope that should that should help. But I'll also put parentheses to try to make the operation order of operations clear. All right. Other questions on regular expressions? All right. All right. So more language processing stuff. So I'm not going to ask you to do any like parsing, but I'll just ask, say, given a grammar, make a parse tree for an input. <clears throat> so this is the same grammar we had in our um, homework, and I'm asking to make a parse tree for this A A C C D B A. Yeah. Uh, does that even have an output tree? Uh, maybe I did I mess up here? I'm sure it's not oh, whoops! It should be B at the end. 
Not A. You're right. You're absolutely right. Sorry about that. That was supposed to be B, I think, right? Does it then work with B? Yeah, Apologies for that. I did make that. I did intend that to be actually parsable. Sorry for those who looked at this. Sorry about that. Yeah, so you, you can sort of in, intuitively looking at this, every T, so, okay, so I guess first of all, grammars. What are the components of a grammar? So just like regular expressions or state machines had components in them or things that make, make it up. For grammars, what do we have? Yeah. Terminals and what? Terminal, well, terminals are a type of symbols. So we have terminals in the language. Non-terminals, non they're called non-terminals, yeah. So we have terminals and non-terminals. Um, uh, so the, so kind of analogizing to regular expressions, what are the terminals of the language? What are the terminals of the grammar? Yeah. Yeah, they're the actual input language. The non-terminals are not uttered. They're not in the input language. They're kind of virtual symbols that help organize the structure of the grammar. Uh, so I'm going to use the convention on the exam that lowercase letters are, are terminals, just like in regular expressions, and uppercase level letters are non-terminals. And so what else does a grammar have in order to relate non-terminals to other non-terminals and terminals? Yeah. Yeah, they're produ the production. So they're called, yeah, it's, it's using the arrow, but it's supposed to be a production. It's not like a logical implication. Um, but yeah, these are the production. So the actual rules that tell you how to decompose a non-terminal or a grammar construct into another set of symbols. So what else for a grammar do you need to know? The starting, the starting production. So you need to know what the starting non-terminal and starting production is. And so by convention, it's always the first production. So this, the non-terminal on the left side of the first production is always going to be the root of the tree, the root of the parse tree. So there's two ways to try to um, generate this parse tree. You can either go bottom up, start from the symbols on the bottom, and try to figure out uh, which productions apply starting from the bottom, or you can go from the top down, or kind of both. To reason about this a little bit, you can see that the starting symbol the only place A and B are ever used is in the starting production, and it always begins and ends one of the productions. So this is why I think your, your fellow student observed that what I had before was, was not parsable, because uh, it always has to start with an A and end with a B. Uh, but notice that you can put the non-terminal in between A and B, and so you can have this repeated nested structure, just like parentheses where you have nested parentheses in, say, simple C or other programming languages, whenever you see a, a structure like this, where you have this self-reference to its own uh, symbol, you're, you're, uh, having, you're having nesting. Which, uh, so how would we express this nesting in regular expressions? So this is uh, an expression of it in, in context-free grammars. How could we express the same thing in regular expressions? Oh, sorry, I thought you... Okay. Yeah. You can't. Yeah, good. That was, that was a trick question. So if you take discrete two, I don't know if they did in discrete one. Um, uh, the, one of the main kind of language design points or language uh, uh, like mechanical fundamentals that we learned about was that uh, this kind of, you know, having matched parentheses is not expressible, or at least unbounded matched parentheses, was not expressible in regular expressions, because you can't count. Okay. All right, so let's, let's, make the, uh, let's make the tree for this. So here's what we're... Here's our grammar. Let's keep our grammar here. And here is our...
Oh, okay, it's highlighted there. Okay, should we go top down or bottom up? Top down. Okay, I think top down is easier as well. All right, so what's the what's the root symbol? What's the root node in our tree? T, because it's the starting symbol. All right, given that the input has an A at the beginning, uh, what production is going to be the likely or the only choice in this case? A, T, B. Good. So we've already matched part of our input. We've matched an A, T, B. So looking at our input, we've already matched the first character and the last character. Why didn't it match this character? Or do we know if it matches this character yet? Yeah, it's got to be part of the second B. Now, if I had three Bs here, may or ten Bs, it might be a little more confusing to see that. Um, okay. So we've got another T here. So we've matched. So I'll put our input down here um, to help us keep track of it. A, A, C, C, D, B, B. And when I when I successfully hit a uh, terminal, I'll uh, I'll refer to our input language. Now this is now doing this top down. It's kind of a guess. Uh, we went over rigorous ways to do this. You can apply those if you like, like bottom up parsing or or recursive descent. But I'll try to make them small enough where you can you can kind of work it out. Okay, so we have T in the middle here. Um, with there's so there's two productions here. Uh, which production is likely to have us match this input? The first one, yeah. So again, we've got A and B with T in the middle. So now we've got another T here, and the inputs left to match don't have any A's. So which production is likely to match our input? The second one. Yeah, V. Okay, so now there's two V productions. Uh, which one is likely to match here? CV, okay. So let's match CV. All right, we've got V again. Which one is likely to match here? CV again. That's really our only choice. And now we've got a V. Which production is matched here? Yeah, four. Yeah, four. All right, I think we're done. Questions? Questions on this one? So the sure way to do this, I will strive to give you a valid input. I, I don't want to be that tricky. I did not mean to give an invalid one. Um, yeah, I don't think I, I have that, that here. Uh, yeah. All right, questions on that? Questions on parsing? Yeah. No, I was, I'm not going to make you do that. Yeah, that, that's kind of, yeah. It, it's better for a machine to do. Um, that's 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 the kind of systematic way to do it, but I uh, you know I don't know. My philosophy is if a machine can do it, I, I don't want to have to do it myself. So I won't make you do it, but I want to just make sure you understand the concept and like the definitions of stuff. But I do have questions about the uh, about that kind of parsing. So I guess first, any, any other questions on parsing, grammars? And so I may have some concept questions like what's a production or identify the production, stuff like that. So just make sure you have those concepts in mind. Um, this kind of parsing, you're probably not going to write a compiler, but you'll probably have to do text processing. And so knowing about regular expressions, parsing, you know, things like this. I think I just encountered recently uh, some book that was talking about parsing regular expressions, and things like this, but um, you know, parsing languages. Uh, it doesn't work. It'll, it'll break if you try to use a regular expression for things that need to be parsed. So just knowing the kind of fundamentals, theories around text processing will probably be helpful. You'll probably have to do text processing at some point in your career. Okay, so I have some concept questions about parsing. So we had our LR parsing algorithm. And, you know, this is an election notes as well. So what was the shift action or how did it change the parsing state. So first of all, LR parsing. What is the parsing state in an LR parser? Where is the parsing state? Or what's, what are all the pieces of an LR parser? I'm guessing you just 
dump this out of your mind after you, after you had to do that very tedious operation. So you mentioned it already. You mentioned part of it. The stack, the stack. You mentioned the stack. So just conceptually, the way this LR parser works is it has a stack. <clears throat> we have the input, of course. The input is some sequence of tokens. So for instance, in our case, we had a, a whatever it was, a, a, c, d, c, 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 d, b, b. Um, what else did an LR parser have in order to do this parsing? The table, yeah, we have this parsing table. This parsing table was just like a finite state machine where it had state transitions here and it had go-to transitions. And uh, what actions can an LR parser take? So an LR parser will look at the current state on the stack. It'll look at this state. It'll look at whatever the next look-ahead character is in the input. And then what actions can it take to do parsing? <clears throat> yeah. Shift. So go to uh, so uh, so go to is one of the actions it takes. I guess in the state transition table, you had shift, and there was another action that go to is part of. Yeah, reduce exactly reduce. So there was shift reduce, and the go to table was part of that um, go to operation. What other actions? Well, start wasn't an action. So start was just a starting state. But it's close to start. It's the, the opposite of start. Stop, yeah, accept, accept. And then there was one other action, with, you know, just like in a finite state machine. Error. So we didn't, we didn't really cover this much, but there's, you know, these, these are the four actions that an LR parser will take. Okay, so what did shift do? What did shift do? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it it moves it moves the input onto the it moves the input character onto the stack, updates the state, updates the state, and then moves this look ahead to the next input. That's what shift would do. What about reduce? What did reduce do? Yeah. Exactly. It pops off, pop, pops off elements from the stack and just throws them away. And then what does it do next after it pops elements off the stack? Yeah. Yeah, it pushes a non-terminal onto the stack. So how does it know which non-terminal to push onto the stack? The production rule. So. <clears throat> the shift action would update the state of the parser. The reduce action would identify the production. So reduce, the number here is the production number. <clears throat> so it tells you, it basically is matching the right-hand side of a production and then replacing it with the left-hand side. Uh, and then the go-to state was used to figure out which next state to go to after recognizing a whole non-terminal. That was what the reduce action did. <coughs> so questions on that? This is just conceptual. Yeah. Say again. Oh, it's another it's another state. So let me actually show the probably clear to show a real example of this. This is what the tables look like for an LR parser. When matching terminals, we have you know, three poss four possible actions, shift, reduce, error, and accept. The blank ones are error. And we have the go-to table, which tells you how to move to the next state for non-terminals. And so shift, <coughs> sorry, shift and go-to tell you how to transition to the next state. So shift two says go to this state. Go to four says go to this state. 
But a little maybe confusingly, this number is not the state. This is the production that you've matched. So the reduce action is a combination of finding the production that you match, looking at what non-terminal is being matched, and then using the go-to table to move to that state, that next state. And this homework is uh, on the website. I, uh, it wasn't, it, you know, it's a web course as well, but I also linked it um, to the assignment section just so, yeah, I wanted everything on the website as well. Oh, sorry, you can't, you can't see that. All right, so that's probably the most more sort of nitpicky part of the conceptual questions. I didn't want to make you go through the shift reduce. It's very easy to make mistakes as a human doing it. But just have in mind kind of the basic, basic broad strokes of how this algorithm works. All right, other questions on parsing, parse trees? All right, um, let's see. All right, so we're about halfway through and we're about uh, halfway through the lecture. So let, let's, let's take a break here. Um, yeah, let's do a 10 minute break. Come back at uh, 10.55. All right, any questions on what we covered in the first half? All right, let's go to the second half. Um, so there's some questions from the projects in here. Um, so first, uh, draw an AST for a simple C program. <clears throat> so as uh, somebody asked before, you know, do we have to make it accurate to the ast.h given? I'll put in the question, you don't have to do that. Just get the, get the right structure of these, of these uh, programs, you know, the nesting structure of compound statements where declarations and uh, all the pieces live on the tree. And so you can make it as abstract as needed, just, just retain the kind of hierarchical structure. All right, so let's just, let's, I guess, just go through and do this as an example. It's sort of hard to, I mean, this is very visual, so it's kind of hard to ask how to do this. All right, so uh, what's the root of a simple C program? Is, yeah. Just, oh, that's, so is this the root of the tree? Yeah, you could say program. So there's, so I, I can't. Yeah, I think I called it program in the in the AST. But the idea is that everything in the file, all functions, are part of the one tree, a single tree. Um, and now lists you could just do as siblings on the tree. Uh, so what's the next construct for this program? What's the next construct on the tree, or the next level? Which constructs are there? Yeah. Yeah, the function definitions. So whatever, so I can't remember all the exact um, names of these. I'll just call it func def. So this is the next level of the hierarchy. And um, so let's do, let's do uh, f. So with the next level, what are the siblings of this func def tree for f? What elements do we have? Yeah. So we have the name, we have a declaration list somewhere. We have a parameter list somewhere. Yeah, we have the actual body. Well, okay, so where is declaration list? Is there a declaration list in this function? The body was statement list. I think we called it statement list, but yeah, you have the body. All right, so um, let's sanity check and make sure we have everything. So uh, F, do we have F on this tree? Yes, it's under ident. What about params? 
We've got it here. So this is going to be a list. You can just make them siblings. What about this part? What's that? It's, uh, yeah, what is this? Is this the return type? What's the return type of this function in simple C syntax? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, well, so this is the type of the function. So if you remember the tree, this whole thing can just be represented with a single node. This can just be represented with a single node called type. At least that's how I represented it in the tree that I gave you. And this makes it simpler because you don't have to think about param types or return types. It's just a type. And um, okay, so what were the what were the, the kinds of types we had in simple C? So there were primitives and there were compound types. What kinds do we have? What are some examples of types in the simple C language? And they're analogous to C, yeah. Okay. Int and char, so you have like primitive types. Uh, what other kinds of types did you have? Think like in C. What else? What other kinds of things can you declare in C? Yeah. You have a pointer type. So a pointer type was another compound type. What else do we have? Yeah. Array types. Function type, yeah, exactly. So function types... In simple C, we're denoted with this arrow. So the so let's go over what the type structure looked like. In C, you also have function types. Their syntax is horrendous. I always have to look it up. They're, they're function pointers. Who's worked with function pointers? You ever work with function pointers? It's, it's a little painful. So I, I find this arrow syntax a little easier to work with. So a, a function type is a compound type because it's basically because it's not it, it's not a terminal it's a non-terminal. You can think of compound types as grammar structures, whereas primitive types are just single words in the language. So if I've got a type node here, and it's a primitive type, it's just going to be a single terminal in the language. If I have a type that's a function type, it's a non-terminal, and it contains some other type on the left and some type on the right. You can think of it almost like an operator that describes the input and output types of a function. For our function type here, what's the uh, input type? What's the left type of this operand? Int. Actually, I wrote this wrong. There should be parentheses here because it's actually a list, a type list. Um, so this is an int type. And on the right side, what kind of type do we have on the right side? Int, another primitive type. So you can think of type constructors as non-terminals, as a little grammar for building up a type. Similarly for pointer types. So if I have, uh, in simple C, this was declared, I think, like this. So here's a complicated type. I've got a I've got here I have a function type. I've got a function type inside of a pointer type. inside of another pointer type. So this kind of type is also expressible in C. So this is a pointer to a pointer to a function. Or a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to a function in C. You can also express this in C. Um, but let's do the type tree for this. So C's type tree for, for dealing with their type declarations are, are really painful to deal with. 
So let's do this for our language. So what's the root of this type tree? What kind of type do we have as the root of this type tree? Pointer, yeah. So we've got a pointer type. And underneath that, it has what? Another pointer type. And under that pointer type, what kind of type do we have? Function, yeah, good. So there's a function type under here. And under that function type, what, what types, what kinds of types do we have under the function type? Yeah, we have a primitive type for int. We have a primitive type that's int. And for the return value, we have another primitive type. That's int. Make sense? Questions on this? Let's do one more. So let's say we have a function that takes an int and returns, let me just write the uh, declaration here. I think this should be parentheses. All right, so we've got two arrows here. What, what kind of type is this? What is this type declaring? Yeah. So say again, so it's a function. So let's look at the, let's look, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so if you didn't catch that, this is a function, so this whole thing is a function, and this function takes an integer as its parameter, and it returns a function. So in simple C, we didn't have real support for like first class functions, but there are languages that do. And in C, this would be, you, this would be a function that takes an integer and returns a pointer to a function. So I, I put this pointer in here to make it like kind of extra obfuscated. But there's nothing stopping you in, in C or any other language from returning a function itself from another function. If you take programming languages here, you may learn about functional languages where functions are first class and you can actually pass them around like data and they, they still work like functions. Yeah. So how do you tell that this is a take an integer returns a function and instead of taking a function? Oh, I see what you mean. Instead of a, a function that takes a function. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So the order of operations here, uh, it matters. So I, parentheses would be very confusing to disambiguate this, but you're right. Um, without, uh, if your grammar is ambiguous, you can't tell the difference between a function that takes a function as input. Um, just like with regular expressions and math, by convention, like functional languages, they're right associative in functional languages, I think. Yeah, they're usually right associative in functional languages. So um, I'm probably not going to ask you this, but uh, if you had done either way, it would have been fine. So depending on the associativity here, um, it's either, yeah, a function that takes a function as input, or it's a function that returns a function as its output. So I didn't really cover this like notion of, of first class functions in this class, but take programming languages or learn about, you know, like Haskell or OCaml or these other functional languages. Um, and those are languages where you can pass around, fun or Python has this as well. Python, you can pass functions in as inputs and return them as outputs. And uh, yeah, it actually is a, it's a cool programming paradigm. It's a very powerful programming paradigm. You can basically get rid of loops and iteration for a lot of, uh, for a lot of programming problems. Okay, so let's, let's assume this is right associative. 
and this is a function that takes an integer as an input. What would the tree look like? Well, we've got a function type here, and on its left side, it takes a primitive type as input, that's int, and on its right side, it has a function type as its return value, and that function takes a pointer to an integer as input and returns a primitive type integer as its output. So this function type takes a pointer type as input, and that's a pointer to a primitive type, an int, and returns a primitive type int as output. Uh, question, questions on this? So just wanted to highlight these type constructors. You'll see these more complex types. I mean, as you study programming languages more, you'll see a lot more complex types. So it's nice to understand them syntactically um, first, so you can actually break down the syntax of it, and you know, you kind of have to know the language to do that, like the question here about the order of operations. Um, but yeah, you can specify them just like you specify any language construct using this grammar. And um, yeah, functional style, where you're passing functions as input and output, is a, it's a popular style. It's a pretty pretty mainstream programming style now. It's heavily used in Python. Um, this uh, yeah, functional functional programming you can do it in Python uh, nowadays. All right, we're quite far from our uh, original question here of of our um, of our uh, tree here. All right, so uh, getting back to our function. Our function had several components. It had the name of the function, the list of parameters, <coughs> the type, the declaration list, the statement list. So, okay, so what's the type tree for this, uh, for this function? What's that? Uh, say again? So primitive type and integer, is that it? You have two of them. You have the input type and the output type. So I'm just going to write int here to save some space. But this is a function type that takes an int as input and an int as output. Are there any declarations in this in this function? No. So this is you know, empty, or I can just leave it, or null. Uh, statement list. Are there any statements in this function? So in our, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so in our, our I know in, in C, return is a statement, and you can put a return anywhere. In simple C, and you know, this is a minor thing. In simple C, the return expression was part of the function definition. So there was a there was an expression here for the return expression, and this was just to make it easier to compile. If you had a return anywhere in your program, it makes laying out the assembly a little bit more annoying. You have to either add jumps, you have to be able to put the prolog, epilog anywhere, or have an extra branches to jump to the end. So in our language, we had the return expression as part of the function definition. But anyway, that's a minor thing. All right, good. Uh, questions on this? Main is, is similar. Main has its own construct in our language. Actually, it's not a function definition. It's just main. But it's very similar to function. Questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like this. Should we should we go over this? Okay. And what what was your question? Oh. So if you look at the grammar, and you know you'll have it, the AST available to you. The main does not have a return type in the grammar. There's because it's it's syntactic, and so when you see here, there is no type being named. And the tree, the grammar doesn't even um, allow for a type to be declared for main. Um, 
I just designed the language like this so that unlike C where you have to declare main just like any other function, here it's like sort of built into the language. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah. You can think of it as built into the language in the same way that the number two, like you don't have to declare the number two as being an int in C. It's just hard coded in the language in the type checker that it, that it is an integer type. So main in our language in simple C works the same way, or it has a hard coded type. And indeed, when you went to go type check this, you would check it against it per my uh, specification. Yeah. Um, sorry, there's this is all under fun def, func def. I haven't done main yet. I haven't done main. So let me. Uh, I didn't give myself much space here. I think we get rid of this. So let's do main now. So main was like a sort of special version of function. If you remember the AST and the grammar, uh, main had a different grammar construct. So let me let me show show that. And so after this class, this is not going to be so important. But you know, being able to read and understand grammars will likely be useful. Uh, so this was the function grammar. It had the identifier followed by a parameter list, followed by the type, followed by a declaration list, followed by a statement list, followed by expression. And so these um, termi uh, terminals and non-terminals, I mean, there are, there are like, Bison allows you to put um, kind of instant terminals. You don't have to define it in the lexer. You can put kind of instant terminals in the language. But these... Um, non terminal these non terminals like parameter list type these are what you need to know in order to identify the function the kind of abstract syntax of the function but main in contrast was like a function but it just doesn't have the parameter list it doesn't have the type and it doesn't have an identifier instead it has the main keyword followed by just declaration list statement list and expression So those are the only three pieces that aren't just hard-coded keywords for main. So for main here, it has the declaration list, statement list, and expression. and the return expression. So for our example here, uh, what declaration, what's in the declaration list for main? Nothing, it's empty. So this is null or empty string. What about statement list? Also empty. And how about expression? What grammar? Yeah. This is the call expression. Yeah. And what does a call expression contain in its abstract syntax? Yeah. Um, a function that calls and then also whatever Yeah. It has the function that it calls and, and this list here. So um, um, it's totally fine if you want to you know, make this a little, sim little more abstract. You know, you could you could put list here and then put two. You could even put null at the end of it. Um, just if you get the basic structure, the hierarchy, that's uh, that's what I'm looking for. That you, you you sort of just understand the hierarchical nature of these languages. Just like you know, in this deep dive we did on types, just that you get that hierarchical structure because that's kind of the key to language processing. All right, questions questions on this. Okay, so I also had a question on type checking. So this is saying draw an AST again for the follow simplicity program and annotate the expression nodes with the type 
that will be discovered. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good question. So this, yeah, this is this is the return expression. This is the return expression. So looking at the the syntax here. Um, yeah, so there, there's the grammar definition, and because um, Bison doesn't have an automatic AST generator, this is why we have AST.h. You have to like gen, you have to do it yourself. <clears throat> so actually, it was for main. So this is the AST structure for main. So yeah, I'm I'm being sloppy about the actual naming. You don't have to be any more precise than I'm being, as long as it's clear that there are three pieces to main. You could call this expression. You could call it return expression. Um, as long as the hierarchical, hierarchical structure is there, then yeah, you're good. But yes, this, this is part of the return expression. This is how we um, defined our language. All right, so let's do type checking. Give ourselves a new page here. Okay, so I'll just um, quickly draw the tree here. And actually, maybe when I ask this, I'll just ask you to draw the expression tree or something. So let's let's just do the expression. Or actually, no, for type checking. Well, all right. Let me just do let me just do the whole tree quickly. And so this has a declaration list. What's under the declaration list for this main? And why? And statement list, what's under the statement list for this main? Nothing, it's empty. And then we've got a return expression. All right, so what does this tree look like under return expression? Yeah. We've got a binary expression, good. And under that binary expression, we've got two, multiplication, and y. Okay, so when your type checker ran, it would annotate the expression tree with every type that it discovered. And so the, um, oh, actually, oh, sorry. You can actually, this, this is being cut off. <laughs> sorry about that. I was wondering, I was wondering where that was. This is being cut off. All right, so let, let, let's redo this binary expression. I was wondering why that was uh, simpler than I remember. Okay, so under this, all right, so now now this tree is a little, a little trickier. Um, which operator comes higher in the tree here? Asterisk? What do you say? Plus. plus. Who says asterisk is higher in the tree? Who says plus? Who doesn't know? <laughs> So which one is higher priority? Which one, or which one's higher precedence in our language and in C? What's that? Multiplication is higher precedence. Um, so in the tree, higher precedence goes lower in the tree. Because if you evaluate the tree, the multiplication is going to be evaluated first in the tree. So higher in the tree is the plus. So here's our binary expression. The plus is higher in the tree. And so... What are we adding together here? What's being added together? What's on the what's the left operand of this plus? What's that? Another binary expression. And that binary expression is multiplication. And it has two and y. And on the right hand side of our binary expression, we have a string literal. So I know we didn't implement strings, but we, I think we type check them. Right. <clears throat> okay. And so, yeah, this is why multiplication is lower in the tree because if if we were to, if you evaluate this in a post order fashion, you'll do the multiplication first. Just like with like when you did infix to postfix conversions, the postfix, the multiplication was like closer. In the, in the tree. And if you convert that to infix, you have to put parentheses and disambiguate it. 
Um, all right. So if we were doing a, if we were running the type checker on this tree, remember the type checker looks at each expression and then sets its type. It annotates the tree with that with that type that type field. If you remember, there was this type field on every expression. So we can just write that with a different color on our tree. So what is the first type that gets annotated on this tree when, when writing the type checker in, in simple C? Yeah. Two. Two. So because at least the way I describe it to you is to do basically a post order starting with the left node traversal, post order traversal of this tree. Uh, and so what type does two get annotated with? Int. I think I heard int. Yeah. So this will be annotated with int. So that's in that int expression in the implementation, if you remember the, I think I, I can't remember if I, yeah, so if, if you remember the implementation given to you, it just hard codes, and this is how types get hard coded in the language, you just when you see a constant expression, you just always uh, annotate the type, the tree, to have int type. Okay, so what's the next type that gets annotated in this tree? Yeah, yeah, y. Good, y. And uh, so what type does y get annotated to? Int. Y. Why does y get annotated to int? Because it was declared. So when you when you went to Type check, or when the type checker went here, it created a symbol table that associated, that mapped Y to its type. And when the type checker sees a symbol, it will look up in the symbol table to find its type. If it doesn't see it, then type error. You know, unde undeclared, use of undeclared to variable error. <clears throat> okay, so now what is the next node in this tree that gets annotated with a type? Hello. What's that? Hello. So, yeah. Multiplication. Yeah. So, like, if we were doing this informally, yeah, we could annotate hello. The type checker works post-order. So it's, it's traversing the tree from the first node going to the left, and then it's post order traversal, so it traverses its left and right. Once it re once it reaches both uh, all leaves, it then figures out the type of the parent node of the immediate parent node. So how do we determine the type of bin expression? Yeah. So the well, okay, so. It involves the type of an operands, but how do we know the type of an operation? How do we determine the resulting type of an oper of an operand? Like in general. So let's let's look at the type checker again. So we had these, so if we were to just say, look at the type of the operand, that would work for my very liberal type specification of these operators. But what about here? What is the resulting type of a less than operator? It's int. Yeah, so th this, is, this is the same syntax as for a function type declaration. So you can think of operators just as built-in functions. And they have a function type that declares what types of its what the type of its inputs are and the type of its output the return type so given a node that given a function application which is what a binary expression or a function call is it's a function application how do we know the resulting type of that function application Would generally following the rules, so for instance, if binary expression were instead less than, the less than operator, how would we know what the resulting type of applying the less than operator is? 
Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's return type. So if you call a function, it doesn't matter what the operands are. If its return type is string, then the type of that node is string. So the return type is string. So does that, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, all operators in, in, in all languages are really just functions. They're really just built-in functions. You can imagine, you know, you, I think everyone saw, everyone has done the whole postfix to infix, op, um, postfix to infix uh, translation before, I think. And so you can translate this into prefix notation, where you say plus one, two. By the same token, if I had a function called, say, plus one, two. I could say this also by just saying, you know, plus one, two. I could omit the syntax of the parentheses and commas. And I could even make an infix version of this where I put the name of the function in between the operands. You see what I mean? So there's no difference between function calls and operators in languages. It's just syntactic sugar. It's just syntactic differences. But at the end of the day, they're named functions. In this case, the name is a symbol instead of an identifier. But it's just a named function using some symbol. And then syntactically, there are several ways to tell what the operators, operands are. You can either do prefix or infix or postfix. Um, but function calls are really just prefix notation for calling operators. And functions in most languages are, are user-definable operators. But you can imagine having no operators in a language and instead just having everything written with functions and using prefix notation for everything instead. And there are actually languages like Haskell where you can define your own infix operators. And C++ as well. You can do operator overloading. And you can just define your own syntax for it, infix notation. But at the end of the day, there's no linguistic difference between an infix operator that's built into the language and a prefix function call. And all of these have a function type that defines the type of its inputs and the type of its output. And whenever you apply an operator, like multiplication has a single return value. It doesn't matter what, it, what its inputs were as long as they were in integers. It will always have the same return value. It will always have the return value as defined by its function type. So long story short, the type of a binary expression tree or a function call or any operation is whatever the return type of that function is. That's its type. But for the type checker, in order to know that it's type safe, the type checker will check that its input operands match what's given by the user. So I had a very liberal uh, type specification for these, which just said the input operands and the output type all must be the same type. So this was, I said this in text here, the, the notation for this is a little loose because uh, I, I use the same name for this. But the, the text says they're all the same type. They're all the same type and returns that same type. Anyway, so in this case, the type checker, when you wrote the type checker, it compared that the two input types were the same. Here they are, they're in. And so what is the resulting type of applying this multiplication to two integers? What's the resulting type? Int. So it's just whatever the return type of the function is. So binary expression is just a built-in function. And so in order to determine what the type, resulting type, of a function application is, is you just look at the function type definition and use its return type. Questions on this? Questions on this? This probably seems more complicated than it has to be. But to simplify it, you just, just recognize that any operation in a language is just a function application. And you can infer its type by looking at the type 
uh, function type of that operation. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So the type checker, it's still it's still identifying the the type kind of error. I mean, it's it's a type error in the sense that if you tried to add a float and an int, you would get neither a float or an int as your output because there are two different operations in the machine for floating point addition and integer addition. So it's just a quick aside. What happens in C is if you've got, well, yeah, we can just say 3 plus 2.0, and this is a binary expression. Oop, that's terrible writing. That's slightly less terrible writing. So what happens in the C's type system is it will indeed identify this as an int. That will be annotated with an int. It won't be turned into a float on this expression. But what will happen is when it gets to type check the binary expression, so because plus, plus is an overloaded operator, plus is used both for floating point and integer and, you know, all the different bit widths, um, what, the, what the C type checker will do is it'll, it'll first figure out, it'll first pick which plus to use. So um, you can think of there being a table of multiple plus operations. You know, there's there several ways to theoretically think of it. I think what C does in practice is it says, all right, well, I've got one for ints. I've got one for floats. Uh, this is aggressively bad writing. I've got one for ints. I've got a, a plus for floats. Oh, that's off the screen. Ah. So it's got, it's got two choices for the plus symbol, or at least two choices. One that takes two integers as its input. One that takes two floats as its input and returns a float. And you could think of it as also having ones for like double and short and all that. And so what it does, what the type checker does, is it actually infers which operator to use based on the operands. And it has a bunch of built-in rules that um, say, all right, if I see two different operands, then pick the one that is the most precise, that has the most precision. And so it has a hierarchy of, of type precision. Um, it has a, a built-in, uh, yeah, this is, the, this is why I, I didn't want to implement C but it has a built-in list of which types are higher. And so it just, if you have two different types on here, it just says, all right, uh, I'm gonna pick whatever's the more precise type. And then if I, uh, then the other operand, like int, it's going to actually insert a cast for you. So you can think of it, conceptually you can think of it as kind of rewriting this tree as inserting a cast. And this is, you know, this is what the, the type system allows, this, allows it to happen. You can think of this inserting a cast to float, kind of dynamically inserting a cast to float. So that way, you know, the, the type will work out to be a float. Now, it doesn't do this by editing the tree. It does this in, like, the machine code generation step. But, um, yeah, that's how it works. So it, it uses this hierarchy to say, I've got a float and an int, so I need to first insert a cast for the operator to a float, and then once it has two floats, then it has no problem picking out which plus operator to use, and then it inserts the, you know, instruction for float floating point arithmetic. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Uh, so in our language, we don't have this sophisticated type coercion. So now this, this type coercion is, it sort of has pros and cons, pros, it, you don't have to like insert cast yourself. The cons are you can lose track of types and have accidental um, truncation or accidental floating point multiplication errors if you didn't mean to have them. So there are languages that are that don't allow this kind of uh, yeah, coercion. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, on int and unsigned int. Yeah, I don't know why these two. Oh no no no, wait. Oh, unsigned by itself. Oh yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I don't know what unsigned is by itself. I guess it's. That's what I thought too. Yeah, maybe this this table is wrong. Uh, I I I thought that too. Um, yeah, check, check and see. That that seems that does seem. Oh, this is. Yeah, uh, if you find out, let me know, because that's a. Oh, maybe they forgot long, but uh, yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah, they forgot to put long. Yeah, that could be the case. So that, yeah, that's how C works. It uses the, it, it's doing the same thing that your type checker is doing, except it's using that information to add some more functionality, to add this automatic conversion or type coercion, they call it for you. Um, so it's, yeah, you're not just like nakedly putting it in at a float and adding them together. The type checker is detecting that. What in our language would be a type error, detecting that and kind of uh, inserting a cast for you. It's inserting this cast for you when it detects the what it would be a type error otherwise. Okay, so in our language, okay, so we've, we've done a deep dive on functions and how operators in the language are really no different than functions. They're just syntactic sugar for functions. Okay, so let's continue annotating this tree. We've found the leaves just by either having a built-in type or looking it up in the symbol table. And we figured out how to infer the type of an operation by using the operators or functions type and checking the operands that they match the children and using the return type as the annotated type, the resulting type of that binary expression. All right, so now what is the next node that gets uh, annotated, that gets type checked? We only have two more nodes left. Yeah. What's that? Hello, yeah, the string. And so what type gets, gets annotated here? I think it was pointer pointer to char in my in my language, but yes, it would be a string type. In C, it would be a pointer to a character. That would be its type. Okay, and so what's the next node? There's only one node left. We have plus. So in our language, what's the type of plus? It just says the two operands need to be the same type. And if we can conclude that they're the same type, then we can use that type as the output type for our language. So when we go to check the operands here, what do we encounter as our type checker encounter in our language? Type error, yeah, exactly. Two different types. So what's the type of this bin expression? It has no type. So we can't prove the type safety of this program because we cannot conclude what the type of this bin expression is. That's what the type checker does. When, it, when you have a type error, it means the, the compiler could not infer the, the type, even if it might be a correct program or a safe program, it couldn't infer that type. All right, so the, the question here, to get back to what the question was, um, I wanted to just have you go through the process of annotating the tree of types so you understand Okay, you've got built-in types, you have declared types, and you have function types. And the function type checks the operands, and if they, are, if they match the function type, then the resulting type of that function application is the return type, which kind of makes sense, right? So if you have plus and it takes integers and returns an integer, if you know that the two operands are integers, then you can conclude that the resulting type of that expression is an integer. And I also wanted you to like check how type errors happen. They happen when that type checking process fails. And so I uh, said here, circle the node where the simple C type checking discovers a type error. So which node was that? Which node did it discover the type error on? You said it. Yeah, the binary expression here. So that's where we discover the type error. So I'll ask a question you know, similar to this on the exam, just to make sure you understand type checking and type errors. 
All right, and yeah, now you'll hopefully understand a little better what C does, why you get certain errors from the compiler. And if you take programming languages or do more advanced languages, um, you'll see how, how Haskell and other languages have enriched this, this type checking to do more fancy compile time checked, uh, type checking. All right. Okay, so now we're into the back end of the compiler. So the stack frame, uh, or at least for functions, for C-style functions and simple C, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask you. Uh, I'm not going to make it too, I mean, you can't keep going, right? Because you, you can no longer infer, like for main, main returns an int. So, yeah, once you encounter a type error, you can no longer continue type checking because you, you, can, you, you couldn't infer the type of this, and so there's no way to check whether main returns an int because you, can, you, couldn't, have, you couldn't infer this. Um, if I ask for it, yeah. It, it might be helpful to you to have the simple table, but you don't have to show it. You don't have to show it. All right, other questions on type checking? All right, so let's get to the back end. For C-style functions, uh, how do we implement those? How do we implement C-style functions um, in the machine? So the, you know, the architecture, the, the assembly programming and the architecture doesn't support actual C-style functions, like, or doesn't have an instruction for them. Uh, so how did we simulate these functions where you can you know, save the local state and return to the caller. How did we simulate that? Or what was the name of the memory layout that we used? Stack frame. Yeah, I think I heard it. Stack frame. Exactly. And so in the stack frame, I mean, it's, it's good to know this from, from memory. Uh, you don't necessarily have to know the calling convention, but just to understand your language and how languages are implemented. What pieces go into or what goes into the stack frame in order to enable C style functions. Yeah. Uh, any parameters above six parameters. Okay, so parameters. And yeah, you don't have to worry about the calling convention. Different calling conventions do different things, but yeah, you have the parameters. What else? The return address and function. Return address. What else is in the stack frame? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Let's give someone else, yeah. Say again? Okay, so you have the local variables of the function. You have all the locals. What else? Anything else? Yeah, yeah. RBP, so what was RBP? Okay, it was the base pointer. Uh, so this... So yeah, what what which um, yeah what what is it what is it what is it pointing to? It's a pointer. Yeah. Exactly. It's the. It's a pointer. So um, there there's there's a ton of different names for this. This is sometimes called the dynamic link. Um, the uh, yeah I'll call it the uh, yeah or the yeah it's the it's the pointer to the caller's stack frame. So we can just call it the old base pointer because that's, I didn't use any of these other terms in this class. But it's just a pointer to the caller's, the caller's stack frame. So the caller's stack frame is higher on the stack or lower on the stack, depending on how you view it. And, um, and so why, why do we need that? Why do we need that pointer? Yeah. Well, so returning to the return address tells us where to read. Well, what well, depends on what you mean by return. So there's two there's two things you need to do in order to rest, you kind of restore. You want to restore the old or the, the the caller's state. So the caller was running code and it had um, local variables that it was updating, and so we want to restore that state. So there's two things we need to do. So one, we
need to jump back to where we left off after the call. And that's what their turn address is for. And so the, the, the old stack frame, what do we do, what is that for? Go ahead, go ahead. Right, yeah, we had the locals from the callers function. So if I made another function call while I was inside, well, to make this concrete, so if I had, if this was main, and this is f, and this is g, I might have a, a function that calls f with some uh, with some parameter, and I have some other function f which calls g, and some third function g, which just, I don't know, returns x plus 1 or something. Um, then when main calls f, this, uh, the program will construct this stack frame that contains all the information that f needs in order to execute, and also the information here in order that you need in order to restore the call to main. And so it needs to know the address of the program counter or instruction pointer in main, and it also needs to know the stack frame for main because of its local variables and parameters. Similarly, if, I, if I'm in F and I call G, then G needs space for its parameters. We need the return address to jump back into the call to f, we need the old base pointer, which points to f's stack frame, and we need space for locals for g. So that way, when I'm done running g, we'll tear down g's stack frame, and we'll jump back to f's program counter, and restore F space pointer by using this old base pointer we had stored in the stack frame. Any questions? Questions on this? So these are the elements of a stack frame in C-like languages. Uh, yeah, this other languages may extend this, but this is kind of the basic function abstraction um, the information that you need for a you know classic kind of architecture that we have today all right questions on stack frames and then um, yeah I just have a question to actually draw the stack frame actually I just did this <laughs> I forgot I had this question but um, I'll ask you to actually draw out a stack frame, and you can do this conceptually. You don't have to follow an exact convention or use whatever convention you like. You can pass parameters in the stack. You can use registers if you like. Um, but I'll ask you to, to like draw the stack frame at a certain point in the program. So here I said draw the stack frame after G is called from F, and the stack frame has already been completed. And that's basically this. It's like the same thing here where this is what the stack will look like after you have F and G called. Questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, um... Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can put the actual like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe more precise. To actually, well, yeah, let me let me do this one, and then I can show what uh, I'm kind of expecting. So for f, and you can, you know, you can assume that there. So yeah, there's no parameters here, so you can assume that there's some base pointer somewhere. There's some return address. So just make it clear that you like know that there's a return address and there's an old base pointer. You can draw an arrow if you like. You can put an address. Um, this has no locals. 
yeah, this has no local variables. So let's just, uh, you know, this would be F's stack frame. This is for F. And we can put another, we can just push immediately right here. And you don't have to worry about like register staved stuff. So this has one parameter, uh, X. So you can put X or you can put the value or you can put both. I'm uh, not, not going to be too picky about, about how you do this. You'll need some return address, and you don't need to literally put like an address here. It would be nice if you make clear that the old base pointer points to the parent, and then we only had us, and we have a single local here, y. So this would be like sufficient for answering that, that question. So how you actually denote it, there's a lot of flexibility. If you if, just make it clear that you understand that there is a return address that the old base pointer points to the old stack frame, and that there are slots for parameters and locals. Is that that? That's the basic thing to understand about, about stack frames. And as we saw with the security exploit last time, it's good to understand you know, how your tools work under the hood. All right, other questions on, uh, other questions on Stack frames? All right, and then we have some questions on assembly generation. So this is what we were doing the last few weeks. Um, so unless I say otherwise, you're free to allocate things in memory, allocate things in registers. I really just want to test to make sure you get pointers and also this sort of confusing distinction between the uh, you know moving memory onto the stack frame, which involves pointers conceptually behind the under the hood, and then how the language actually implements pointers. So this is all illustrated with this, um, uh, both kind of illustrated with this one example here. So given this following style C code, write equivalent assembly code, x86 assembly code, and as I say, you can store variables however you like, whether it's going to be in memory or in registers. That's fine, but you know we have a reference here, so you're going to need an address at some point. Uh, so okay, so let's take this code and make assembly for it. And actually, I don't need to draw this. All right, so for y equals reference of x. Okay, so if I've got y equals x here, uh, let's not do this. All right, if I've got y equals uh, reference of x, what's the assembly code? Or what's one way to write assembly that would, that would do this operation, this C-like operation? Yeah. Okay, so assuming that, you're assuming x is like allocated on the stack frame. So, okay, so we get the base pointer. And what do we do? The base point. Okay, so you're saying move the base pointer to RAX. Subtract the offset, whatever the offset of X is. And as I said in the question, you can you can just make the assumptions about it. Just state what your assumptions are. So you're assuming that. Um, negative 8 is the offset from the base pointer. Oh, so from RIX, sorry, from RIX. Yeah, it'll, it'll blow away your stack, right. Okay, so, all right, so um, questions on this. So we've, so what your colleague has pointed out is we can take, we, as, we basically assume that Y is stored on the stack frame at offset negative 8 from the base pointer. And so just like in our project, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, X, sorry. Yes. Uh, assume that X because we're getting the reference of X. So just like in our project, the way we um, allocated variables was on the stack, 
as some offset from the base pointer. We just talked about stack frames. That's uh, what the base pointer is pointing at. So if we make that assumption and we want to get the address of x, well, we can compute it. We can compute it by just subtracting that offset from the base pointer. But as your colleague pointed out, we don't want to actually subtract from the base pointer because we'll blow away our, uh, our stack frame. OK. Um, all right, so this RAX now contains the memory address of x. Questions on why that is? Yeah. RAX, RAX is a register. RAX is a register. All the, whenever it's, yeah, the, the uh, percent sign, I think, in at t syntax is always for registers. So this is a register containing the value of RBP. The value of RBP is a memory address that points to our stack frame. Yeah. Um, I doubt it. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, there may be other ways to handle it. Where are you thinking of using the offset? Yeah. So the the I think the reason I think this is I described this in the project, right? The subtraction thing. Did I describe this in the project description? Yeah, so the so why okay, so why couldn't we do so what are you thinking? We can move like this into RAX. So what's the, I guess what's the difference? What's the difference between uh, moving the value of RBP versus using this syntax? Or I guess to put it maybe more directly, What's the difference between what's the difference between these two? What's the difference between these two operations? What's the difference between moving RBP versus moving this memory indirect addressing? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, effectively, yeah. This is the assembly way to say dereference. So if RBP has value, you know, like 0x hex EF, then at the end of this first instruction, RAX will contain EAF. But in this next case, if RBP is hex EF and we move the reference, it'll be whatever the value at memory location location EF is. So I guess one way to say this is if I have like in my RAM at this memory location, I've got you know the number four. If I'm moving the value of the register. RAX is just going to be whatever the register value is. In this case, it's going to be hex EF. Doesn't matter what the memory address value is in RAM. But in, when I use this memory indirect addressing or dereferencing, then if my memory address is 4 and RBP is 0x EF, that memory location, then when I do this move, RAX is going to hold the value 4. Make sense? That's the difference. Um, and subtracting 8. Now, so to actually put another example here. Uh, if I have two memory locations set, if my addition is correct, and I use this offset, memory indirect addressing with an offset, then what's the value of RAX, as long as I've computed this right, what's the value of RAX? So RBP is 0xEF, and I use this memory indirect addressing with an offset. 
as long as my math is right. F minus eight is seven, right? Uh, then what's the value of our AX here? Five, I think I heard someone say five. So that's five because I'm accessing this memory address. Now, I guess the next, well, the next question is then if, um, if I'm trying to implement x equal if, equal, if I'm trying to implement this dereference of x, and so let's, let's, uh, yeah, let's do it this way. So let's say, you know, this is allocated to x. This is my base pointer, RBP. Then how do I make it so what instructions do I need to put in order to get the value of the, ref of the address of x? How do I get the address of x? What, memory, what uh, assembly instructions do I do in order to figure out this address? So if this is the address of x, what memory instructions do I do you know, knowing RBP and knowing that this is an offset of negative 8? What assembly instructions will I need to write in order to make RAX have the address of X? Yeah, exactly. It's exactly what we went through. You, you get the value of RBP into RAX. So after this instruction, RAX is going to be 0XEF. And then, so this is probably a little hard to look at. Let me some comments here and then when I do uh, then when I do the subtraction from our ax now we get the value we wanted we get the value that represents address of X yeah oh sorry you're right you're right you're right you're right you're right you're right it's adding negative 8 or subtracting 8 Sorry about that. You're right. You're right. I knew I was going to make an arith arithmetic mistake. That's right. That's right. I was subtracting it. Yeah, yes, you're right. You're right. I forgot that too. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Good catches. You guys have obviously been busy working on, working on your compiler. I do not pretend to be a, a good assembly developer. All right, questions on that? Questions on this? All right. Um, so I already kind of started answering this. So if Y is stored on the stack at offset negative 8 from the base pointer, what assembly instructions... Or actually, no, we did. Let's, oh, sorry, I missed one. Let's do this one, where we assign the dereference of x. So x, yeah. You're right. We, I want to dereference y, not, not dereference x. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's ignore my, actually, let me, let me fix that. Um, Yes, I want to do reference X. And actually, let's, um, yeah, let's, let's leave it like that. And let's make this X. Thank you for the catches. Yeah, let me, let's, let's get the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. Um, all right, so let's do this one, where Y is now holds the value of X's address, or X's address. And then let's do the assembly for assigning the dereference of y to some value. 
Okay, so this is what we're trying to assign. And let's use our same memory allocation here. And our goal is to assign y to 8. So let's first try to, um, yeah, let's, let's try to assign the memory address. So what we want at the end is, if this is the memory address for x, our end goal is to have this assigned to 8. So what, mem what assembly instructions can we use? Oh, and also, um, we need, uh, let's assume we've already populated uh, RAX with the address of, of um, X here. You know, that's what we did in the previous instruction. So what assembly instructions do we need here in order to update the memory location that X is associated with? So qu questions on the setup. Questions on the setup. So this is our memory layout. We have the base pointer here. RAX is already the address of X. So how do we update the memory location that's associated with RAX? Yeah. Move, say again? A, A oh, 8 to parentheses RAX. That's right. So this is a store to a, using memory indirect addressing before we used a load. But the same idea applies where instead of writing to RAX the register, we write to the memory address that is contained in the RAX register. And so this and RAX contains this address. So at the result of at the end of this, the location in memory will be updated to eight. And all of the other state will be the same. So RAX will still contain hex e, uh, E7 at the end of this operation. It'll still contain that unchanged. And the RAM will be updated. The memory address will be updated. Questions on this? Yeah. Say again? Yeah, so in our compiler, we would then um, update the memory address of Y. I just wanted to show the memory indirect part here. But yes, in our compiler, you would then need to put RAX back into memory for the location for Y. Um, but that's why I say use any variable storage scheme you like. So, you know, modern compilers can keep variables associated with their register for registers for longer periods of time and I wanted to reduce the complexity of this. I just want to make sure you understand the memory indirect stuff. Uh, the next question is actually about that part, is actually about the uh, updating the stack frame. So yeah, I was trying to ask these as small pieces rather than giving you a big assembly, you know, translation job. So this next one is really about, um, is really about that. All right, quick, well, so questions on, questions on these different addressing modes and move operations uh, that we used for our project. Was there another, I thought there was another question over here. Okay. All right, so let's do, actually, we, we actually kind of already did this. Um, so in order to update a variable that's stack allocated, we actually already went over this. So if we're trying to assign x to 8, and this is the location where x is allocated, and RBP 
is the base pointer, then this is the assembly we use in order to, oh, that's the wrong way. So we use this memory indirect um, offset, but instead use it as the destination instead of the, the source. So this is how you access stack allocated uh, variables uh, with offset from the base pointer. So questions, questions on that one? All right. Um, okay, so I also had the conjunction on here. Uh, conjunction is given in lecture. So if you look at the code generation for control flow, conjunction is in the lecture notes. So you can just like look it up. And it even has the same setup as here, where you have RAX and RBX. So it's literally identical to this in the lecture notes. So questions, questions on this? Yeah. This is uh, 12, lecture 12, cogeneration control flow. And the last question is bitwise versus logical and in C. Good thing to know about when you're programming in C. What is the difference? Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically. I mean, the key difference is short circuiting. So if I'm in C and I have this as my condition, if x is 0 and I run this condition, is hello going to be printed out? No. It won't be printed out because of short circuiting. Uh, oh, I already have a program here. So let me make sure I'm not lying. So here's my Hello World program where I say X and printf. So no print statement. Can you see that? Oh, you can't see that. And it should print out if I change this to one. There it is. So this is a consequence of short circuiting. What happens is, is uh, in contrast to bitwise AND, Logical AND works by first evaluating the first expression. And if it's false, it doesn't continue evaluating the right-hand side. Uh, similarly, I think, if I use OR and, um, and the right-hand side, uh, the left-hand side is true, then it won't bother evaluating the right side. So say it doesn't get printed out. But if it's 0, it will get printed out. So that's the consequence of short circuiting in C. And that's the difference with bitwise. So logical um, operators in C are effectively control flow, uh, where if you follow that pattern we saw in class, then um, you, it will just skip over evaluating the right operand when it can conclude that the first operand is true or false. Yeah. Right, yeah. So or will be the opposite. So. If it's zero, it'll run it. If it's one, it won't run the print the print statement. This is logical. So double double symbol is logical. Single is uh, bitwise. 
Uh, don't worry about it. I won't ask this question on the exam. So come, come to me afterwards. So bitwise is what your colleague said. It'll it'll do the you know what you learned in machine architecture. It'll take each bit of the of the data and then do the or operation on the entire. Yeah, yeah. Let's skip that question. Uh, all right, all. Have a good weekend, and um, I'll see you next week for the final.